Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. kid to explain what love is, you kind of get some funny responses. Anybody ever asked a child what, what love is? Anybody want to bravely admit that? No? Okay. Well, uh, fortunately for us, there's a guy named Jimmy Kimmel who does a late night show, the deep scholarly theologian Jimmy Kimmel. And a couple years ago, he took to the streets, well, he, I guess I say he, he, took, he has asked his team to take to the streets to ask some kids what their definition of love is, and I want you to check it out. What is love? What is love? I have no idea. What is love? Um, love is when you love somebody, and it's when you love somebody, and it's really when you love somebody. What do you think it feels like to be in love? It feels like heaven. What do people? who are in love with each other do? They be gross. What does that mean? They kiss, they be gross. That's probably my favorite response right there. They be gross is what she said. What is love? They be gross, right? But when you think about it, if you take that word now, she's obviously referring to like mom and dad being gross and PDA and stuff like that. But when you think about love, I would, I would trade the word gross for this word messy, right? That a lot of times in life, love is messy, isn't it? It's hard, it's difficult. It's hard to love people, especially because of the fact that we're all sinful and we're all broken. Recently, uh, David, our son, who's turning three in a couple weeks, um, actually, I think it's this week, he has started this thing now where he says, Daddy, I love you, and then he pauses, which is like, oh, that's sweet. So he'll say, Daddy, I love you, and then he'll pause, and then he'll say, but I don't like you. <laughs> like literally, Daddy, I love you, but I don't like you. And, and I, I think about that expression, and I think that really encapsulates the heart of what it's like to love people, isn't it? That many times we may feel like, yes, I love this person, I'm called to love this person, but I think it's possible for us to love people, but also not really like them, right? And so today, as we continue this sermon series called Following Jesus in a Flawed Church, last week we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we talked about how every church has problems, right? That we all have issues, we all have struggles, we all have things that we prefer, and we talked about how Jesus has to be the guiding light, it has to be above everything. And so today, we're skipping way ahead to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, because I want to talk to you today about how love is the answer to the problems, not only in the church, but in the world. That if we want to see the gospel go forward, then we have to be people that are able to love others no matter what life throws our way, amen? So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I wanna give you a little bit of context and then I'll give you the big idea or the key thought for today's message. But I would just start out by saying today's message is gonna be 
very, very simple. So it's not gonna be this overly theological uh, sermon. However, I find in my own journey, some of the most simple things in the Christian faith are the hardest things to do, amen? Sometimes the most simple things of loving people well are often the most challenging things for me to do. So what's going on in in the church in Corinth, we talked about last week that Corinth was a very strategic city. It was located on an isthmus and it was a travel city. And so because of that, there was a lot of different backgrounds colliding in the city. So you had all different diverse people. And with that came a diverse range of sin issues and sin struggles. And so Paul goes and he starts this church in Corinth and there's a massive move of God that happens. However, what starts to happen is the world started getting into the church more than the church starts to get into the world. That doesn't happen today anymore, does it, right? So what happens is Paul writes this letter to help redirect them or get them back on track. And I wanna give you just a little bit of context on what's going on in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12 because it's important because I think when you hear 1 Corinthians 13, we all immediately think of what? A wedding, right? That's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's part of why whenever I do a wedding, if a couple asks me about scriptures, I always say I never do 1 Corinthians 13 And the reason why is because I know that some aunt, uncle, or cousin is probably doing a scripture reading with 1 Corinthians 13. But believe it or not, Paul did not write this and go, you know, I'm gonna help weddings be awesome when they, when they, in 2022. I'm just, uh, that's, that's my goal here is I want weddings to be really powerful. That's not what he is doing when he writes this letter. So in 1 Corinthians 10, He talks about idols, and we're gonna talk about that in two weeks. We're gonna talk about the idols that we all tend to worship. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, he gives them instructions for what a proper orderly worship service should look like. Because what's going on is this massive move of God is happening, and not only is the world around them starting to be crazy, but there there is a lot of craziness even happening within the church. And so Paul wants them to understand, hey, this is what worship is supposed to look like. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the gifts that we all receive as believers, the spiritual gifts that when we come to Christ, God gives us a very specific gift or gifts that we are called to use in and through the local body of Christ to reach people for Jesus. So then on the heels of that is where we encounter 1 Corinthians 13. Because he's talking about, okay, don't let idols happen. Don't make sure your worship services are right. Make sure you use your gifts properly and these what they are. And then he says, oh yeah, wait a minute, time out. Don't forget to love people. Don't forget to let the love of Christ dwell in your heart. So that's the context that we will be diving into. If you have a listener guide, I wanna give you the kind of the key thought for today. It's very, very, very simple, but it's this. It's if we wanna be more like Jesus, we have to love like Jesus. If we wanna be more like Jesus, if we wanna follow him, if we wanna show him to the world, then we have to love how Jesus loved. Well, the question is, how did Jesus love? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you have a Bible, we'll begin in verse one. So 1 Corinthians 13 verse one says this, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. And then he goes on to say in verse three, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing then I want you to look ahead at the second part of verse four. Skip over the first part. The second part says, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. And then it says, it does, what does that next word say? Not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no records of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. So what is Paul trying to tell us? Well, he starts trying to define love by telling us what love is not. He tells us what love is not. So what he's doing here, nowadays, if if any of you have ever heard people talk about love, how many of you have ever heard people say, follow your heart? Anybody ever heard that phrase? Got a few people? Yes. So follow your heart, right? Now they're, they're talking about 
romantic love probably when they say that. However, I think they're also talking about just how you live your life, right? That just follow your heart. Well, the problem with that is the Bible tells us time and time again that our heart as a human is sinful and corrupt and fallen, right? So if we follow our heart, our heart is ultimately going to lead us astray. Now in verses one through three, and really throughout this chapter, Paul uses this Greek word to describe love. It's this word we've probably all heard in church. If you've been in church for any amount of time, it's this word agape. Now there's four different words in Greek that are used to describe love. The other words are uh, storge, which is kind of like a family love. It's kind of like the, hey, you took the potatoes, but it's okay, I love you because you're my family. Um, it, there's also phileo, which is like brotherly love. Then there's eros, which is the, the same, the kind of love that the girl was referring to when she says, you be gross. It's like the romantic love. It's like, ooh, gross, mommy and daddy are kissing, stop that. So that's, those are not the words that Paul's using here. In this entire chapter, he uses the word agape or agapen, and it is an unconditional love. It's a love that cannot be earned. It's a love that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many times you mess up. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you make. It means I love you regardless. And so that's important to remember that because when we see this word love, it's not something that's conditional because if you're anything like me, a lot of times when we try to show love to someone, we expect something in return, right? I'll scratch my back if you scratch, or I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back, right? We've all heard that before. I'll do a favor for you if you do a favor for me. And that's not what Paul is saying. So he uses this list of different things that are going on in the first century. He says, I could speak in the, the tongues of men and of angels, but if I didn't have love, and then he uses this metaphor. He says, I would be like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now he's, believe it or not, he's actually not talking about the Corinthian praise team, okay? That's not what he's talking about. What he's referring to is in the first century, there were in the streets, there were these pagan worshipers that were known for wailing a, a cymbal or wailing on a gong. And so what he's saying is, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but rather if you don't have love, you might as well be like these pagan worshipers, right? You might as well be like these pagan worshipers. And he's saying that is not what love is. So what is Paul saying to us? Well, he's saying this, if you've got a listener guide, it doesn't matter what we do for God, if our heart isn't right with God. That we can show love, because see many times in church, especially for those of us that have been around church for a while, if we're not careful, we start to do the works of church just because, right? Just because it's, that's the right thing to do, or that's what we're supposed to do, or that's what they tell us to do. And we start to do these things, but we're not first making sure that our heart is right. And I would even add another step further. We're not first hearing from God on what he wants us to do, right? We're not listening and saying, Lord, use me. This past week, I, I talked to one of my best friends in ministry. His name is Michael. And he is the worship pastor and the associate pastor at a church in Louisiana. And Michael served with me at my previous ministry assignment and he felt called to go to this church and he really particularly grew to form a deep bond and friendship with their senior pastor. That was a big part of why God was calling him and his family there. And he called me this past week and he said, Russell, I don't know what to do because he said, I just found out two days ago that our senior pastor has not only left the church, not only has left his position as a senior pastor, but it came out that he was having an affair. It's devastating, right? It was someone on their staff, just absolutely devastating. And he was like, I don't know what to do. So we talked and I encouraged him, I prayed with him, but I share that with you. And by the way, that's, that's all public knowledge that the senior pastor's wife addressed the church and very much just called it out. And God's doing a work of healing and restoration in their midst. And I share that with you though, because that was a haunting reminder for me that even as, as a pastor, as someone on church staff, it doesn't matter how close we are to the church. If we're not careful, if our heart isn't right, if we're not hearing from God first, we can kind of just caught in the trap of just doing the work of ministry. I vividly remember on our deacon retreat this past year, I was so floored 
and blown away with when Drew Harden shared his testimony about what God did in his life a few years ago. And he read this book by Dallas Willard called Hearing God. And he talked about how for years, obviously we know the Hardens, we love the Hardens, they serve faithfully. But for years, he finally had this epiphany that he was serving without hearing from God first. And I think if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in that exact same spot, right? That we need to hear from the Lord and then we go and serve. That principle is still true for us today that Paul is saying it doesn't matter. All, you can do all these things, you can do all the works, but if we don't have a heart of love, then it really doesn't matter in the long term. So he goes on to say in the second part of verse four, he tells us further what love is not. He says this, he says, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Now that list, when you first read it, you think, okay, I could probably handle that. But when you really ponder it for a minute, that's not exactly easy for us to do as Christians, is it? I mean, think about jealousy. We have a built-in mechanism to enhance jealousy. Do you know, want to know what it is? Facebook, Instagram, social media, TikTok, whatever it might be, right? We see people, we scroll, and I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm, I'm on them. My Instagram account was hacked this past week. Y'all pray for me. It's probably a good thing, at least according to Liz. But it's a built-in, if we're not careful, jealousy mechanism, right? Because we watch people's highlight reel. It's not their real life. They don't post the picture of their toddler melting down, right? They don't post the, the, the fight that they got in with their spouse. They post their, their vacation to Turks and Caicos, right? And you're like, that would be nice. God would really speak profoundly to me in Turks and Caicos, right? I hear the Holy Spirit dwells there, right? Must be nice. And Paul is saying love is not jealous. He says it's not rude. You would think being good, God-fearing, Jesus-loving people, being rude wouldn't be that difficult, but many times it's hard. It's especially hard, I find, with the closer we are to someone, it's hard to be rude. It's hard not to be rude sometimes, right? Because you, get, you have this relationship and you're like, well, they love me regardless, right? They're family, right? And so Paul is saying love is not jealous, it's not proud, and it's not rude. I read this, this, he later says in verse six, he says that love rejoices in the truth. And I found that to be a powerful statement because I think when we think about love, we think, well, I've just gotta be nice to everybody, right? And yes, we are called to be kind, but I find that we can be truthful and still be loving simultaneously. Those two things are very hard to walk but as Jesus followers, we are called to be both loving and truthful. So we can tell somebody, I love you, but then be honest about how something is going on in that situation. Love rejoices in the truth. But in order to do that, we have to make sure that what our heart is in the right place first, amen? I read a quote this week from Greg Mott, who's the senior pastor of First Baptist Church in Houston. He wrote a book on following the will of God and he said he was talking about his sermon preparation and he said, my ministry was completely revolutionized when I realized that sermon prep was not simply a process of paying my dues with study and then asking God to bless the message that I prepared, right? So he was like, I'm writing this message. Okay, Lord, I got this really good message. Will you, will you bless it for me? And then he goes on to say, my prayers for blessing and power, this is awesome, were too late. He says, I had already created the whole thing with the right heart, but in the wrong order. The right heart, but the wrong order. He said, I was trying too hard. The switch came when I became conscious that I had been asking God to bless my ideas instead of asking him for his idea. God's power always accompanies God's will. We wanna do the will of God we wanna be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have to ask him for his will first, amen. There's a principle in AA, it's called the third step prayer. And that every addict that's getting sober is, is taught to say this prayer. And in this prayer, they say essentially this, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will, thou will. So if we want to make sure that we are not doing the things that love is not, I know that's a lot of nots, then we have to make sure we're hearing from God first, right? Let's look at verse four again. 
the first part of it. And Paul will go on to tell us now that he's established, okay, this is not what love is. It's not doing all these things. It's not doing works. It's not all of this other stuff, but this is what love is. He says this, love is patient and kind. And then in verse seven, he goes on to say, love never gives up, love never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So the second thing, now that Paul has said, okay, this is not what love is, now he tells us this is what love actually is. He says it's patient, it's kind. Now, it should be easy for us to do those things, but it's not, especially not only with those we're close to, but I find, and I may be alone in this, but does anybody find that it's difficult to be patient and kind when you're stressed out? right? I mean, it's hard. It's hard. When you are having a stressful week and things are difficult, it is really hard to be patient and kind. When things are great and, you know, work's going well and everything's clicking on all cylinders and stuff isn't getting crazy, it's really easy to be patient. Or when people are being kind to you, right? But when you're stressed and when people are being rude to you, or unkind, it's very difficult to be patient and kind. And notice that Paul doesn't give any caveats there. He just says, love is patient and kind, right? Here's what we need to know. Here's what Paul is telling us. A good indicator of how loving we are is examining how patient we are with the most difficult people or in the most difficult situations of our lives. I'm gonna say that again because that was very, very uh, overwhelming for me this week when God showed it to me, okay? A good indicator, or if we wanna know how loving are we, how much like Jesus are we, a good indicator of how loving we are is examining how patient we are with the most difficult people or perhaps in the most difficult situations of our lives. Because again, it's easy to love people when things are going well, but when things are difficult, it's a lot harder. You wanna know how I know? I got a three-year-old at home, right? The other day, David was sitting at the kitchen table and he said, daddy, I want ice water. And so I said, all right, buddy, I got ice water. Put the ice water in front of him. No, I don't want ice. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So I pour the ice out and just give him water. No, I don't want water. I mean, just back and forth and back and forth. And I have to say, okay, Lord, I'm preaching on love this week. (laughs) Give me your strength. I'm calling your people to be patient and kind. Help me model this, right? It's easy when he he says cute things, like I posted on social media yesterday, that's easy to be loving and kind, but when he's difficult, it can be difficult for all of us to show love, right? But then we also see some positive examples of that, that when people in our life show us kindness and grace and compassion when it would be easy not to, I debated on whether or not sharing this or not, but I think it's a hilarious and real life illustration. It actually happened just yesterday. So we were at a a graduation party and our boys got in the swimming pool and uh, we didn't bring swimming clothes. And so our youngest did not uh, have a swim diaper on and we were about to take him out and uh, he had an accident. And let's just say it wasn't number one, okay? (laughs) It was humiliating and embarrassing. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, help us. But the people that were hosting the party, it would have been really easy for them to be impatient and upset and unkind. But they were so loving and so compassionate and so caring. And even as their pastor, they said, hey, it's okay. We've been there too, right? That's what Jesus is calling us to do. Are we patient and kind and caring with people even when it's difficult? Look at verse seven again, because he says, love never gives up hope, love never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. What is Paul saying there? So in the Greek, the way this literally translates, he says, all things it bears, all things hopes, all things endures. The word for all things in the the Greek is this word panta, P-A-N-T-A. It comes from the root word pas, and it's essentially talking about all things, but it's using this analogy. In the, in the original language, when someone heard that, they would have thought of a picture, okay? A picture, like almost like a painting, but they would not think of necessarily the whole picture. 
because in the Greek, when you use that word, it was actually referred to as one piece at a time, okay? One piece at a time, you're painting the whole picture. Why is that important and why is that significant? Because I find that sometimes many in our life, these little encounters we have with people that seem insignificant, that seem like they don't matter, no one else will see, no one else will know, when we choose to show the love of Jesus in those little small moments, guess what we're doing? We're painting the whole picture of what God's love really looks like, right? We're showing people one piece at a time and they just see this one little part. All I saw was how he handled that difficult situation. And I don't know much about him. I know that he goes to Sunset Canyon. I know that he says he loves Jesus. And when I see that one little encounter, I go, wow, he must serve a really big God, right? You wonder how I know you can know immediately what the whole picture looks like? I've got an illustration here. I'm gonna ask for some help. Okay, I'm gonna ask Mr. Joe Bowman. Can you tell, tell me here what this is? You see, how about any, anybody? How about Joe House? You know what that is? It's a one dollar bill, right? Let's give him a round of applause. Here we go. I'm giving him a dollar bill. People are gonna. I hear the pastor gives out money. You don't. You only have to see a small part of it to know the whole picture, right? And so Paul is saying that when you show Jesus, even in those little small moments, you're painting the whole picture of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Look at verse 13. He says this, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest, y'all say greatest, the greatest of these is love. Now I want you to, if you have an actual physical Bible, flip over to 1 John chapter four. If you don't have it, it's okay, we have it on the screen because we have to use scripture to interpret scripture because if he's saying the greatest of these things is love, then I think we should look to another place to help us interpret what is love really like. Like where, where do we find the ultimate measure of love? And in 1 Corinthians chapter four, or sorry, 1 John chapter four, verse 10, it says, this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And then in verse 11, it says, dear friends, since, we, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. The third thing that we need to know about love is what love produces. And essentially, love is producing love, right? Love multiplies, and that means that we show it to other people. The direction that Paul leaves us with is that if we have experienced Jesus's love in our own life, if he has come into our life, if we have received him, then it shouldn't just stop there. Notice that in 1 John chapter four, it doesn't say, hey, we love other people because we're awesome, right? It doesn't say we love other people because we have the inherent ability on our own. No, it says, if we have experienced the love of Jesus in our own life, that out of that overflow, that's how we're able to show kindness and patience and compassion to others, even when they don't deserve it. You wanna see an interesting experiment here? So what essentially what John tells us is that the reason we can love others is because of Jesus, right? So flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter four, or sorry, for chapter 13, and I want you to look at verse four. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna read these few verses, but instead of the word love, we're gonna use the word Jesus, okay? Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Jesus does not demand his own way. Jesus is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. I would add parenthetically because of the cross. Jesus does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Jesus never gives up. Jesus never loses faith. Jesus is always hopeful and Jesus endures through every circumstance, amen? amen. That we can do those things because of Jesus. So in other words, if we have Jesus in our heart, we have experienced his love. And if we have his love, then love produces action. If we've experienced God's love in our own lives, 
it should be expressed in how we love others, amen? Even in the most difficult circumstances. I'll close with this story. It's a story about a guy, I don't wanna miss his name. His name is Richard Reed. And Richard lived in Los Angeles for a long time. And Richard's fell on hard times. He had a difficult life. Eventually, he found himself homeless. And it seemed like every opportunity that he had to try to get on his feet, something just would knock him down and knock him down and knock him down. And finally, he went to his church. He went to his pastor. He was a famous pastor in LA, and the pastor brought him in his office, and the church came alongside him and helped him get back on his feet. Things started to turn a corner for him. But then the pastor said, hey, I, I don't, you shouldn't just stop there. Like, don't just get back on your feet and let it stop with you. The pastor charged him. He said, hey, this city, if you haven't noticed, has a lot of people going through a similar situation that you did. They have a lot of people that are struggling with homelessness and things like that. And so the pastor, now that this Richard Reed was back on his feet, he challenged him to start an organization. And that organization is called First to Serve. And this organization comes alongside homeless people that are struggling with difficult situations and it helps them get back on their feet. This organization has now impacted hundreds of thousands of people throughout the LA area. As a matter of fact, they now have 15 different facilities that they get to use to bless other people. Richard Reed knew the heart of, hey, when we have received love, we don't just keep it to ourselves, do we? We have to turn around and show it to others. Here's my challenge for you today. If you're here today and you're a Jesus follower, don't let it stop with you. I would encourage you this week as you encounter some difficult or stressful situations, we all have them, right? Think about what God has done for you and think about the fact that Paul charges us to be patient and kind and compassionate and caring even in the most difficult situations in life, amen?